Okay, I invite you to stand and take your Bibles. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 2 tonight and uh, just kind of get going from there. And I need to, uh, to get, get moving. Hopefully you have a handout and we will pick up where we left off. Hey, how many uh, narcissists does it, change, does it take to change a light bulb? None. They use gaslighting. Someone sent me that this week and I... I don't know. Am I the only one people send narcissist jokes to? I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> All right. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, while, you're, while I'm turning there, I, I want to uh, reintroduce uh, uh, someone who was here Monday night. Over here is uh, Rand Hummel, and I want to say publicly uh, what a blessing you've been to me. Uh, I can't believe that I'm preaching and you're sitting there. I've, I've, it's hum very humbling because this man has been used in thousands and thousands of teenagers' lives my life as a teenager included. And when he was for years and years uh, part of the Wilds camp in North Carolina, I spent one wonderful summer there as a, as a college kid counselor, uh, but many times visiting as a camper. Uh, now God's using him in the Wilds camp of New England. But um, uh, this is a man, church, who has spoken into my life in high school. I believe he probably came out to Tri-City at some point and maybe spoke out there too when I was growing up in Kansas City. Um, so someone that ministered to me in my formative years and ministerial thoughts. So uh, thank you for being here. I want to get a picture with you afterwards and send it to my parents. Um, all right, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, welcome all of you, and let's read verses four through eight. Familiar verses, we're just trying to kind of think about them through the lens of narcissism and how this would really speak against that. So verse four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Well, you may be seated. We started uh, last time to lay some important groundwork for uh, this topic. We provided some definitions and some characteristics, and let me review quickly uh, just so we can rewrap. This was two weeks ago. We didn't have church last Wednesday. Uh, so we can rewrap our mind around some of these definitions and these, the complexities, really, of a narcissist. I, I, I've said this, maybe I said this two weeks ago, I really wish there was a better word for it. There isn't. It's a hard word, a hard word to say, and it's, a, it's, it's one of those words that has a plethora of definitions. Uh, we're seeking to kind of narrow those down through the, the funnel of Scripture and see what we can uh, discover the Bible having to say about them. Well, the Bible doesn't say much specifically, but it does deal with the concept of a scorner in uh, the book of Proverbs. So whenever you come across someone who refuses correction or who is full of pride or he, who is stubborn in, in, in insisting upon their own way, then you're going to find someone that I believe is showing narcissistic characteristics. And then on top of that, tonight we read, for a reason, Philippians chapter 2, and I believe the Bible would speak on the positive side, well, here's how you should act. And that speaks to us as far as encouraging us to have the mind of Christ and things like that. What are the sources? Uh, we looked at these verses, Proverbs 9, 7, and 8, uh, 21, 1, and 15, 12, and uh, 15, 12 says, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Well, question number two on the screen is uh, what are the sinful sources behind narcissism? And very quickly, there was pride and insecurity. And uh, we wrote these down last time. I'm just getting us back up to speed. And to some degree, we all deal with pride and we all deal with insecurity. Uh, and so, uh, but not, not all of those things are necessarily going to evidence themselves in clinical narcissism or even really uh, ob observable narcissism, but they're there. That's the root. It's sin. Sin is the root of all this, of the way we, we come across. And so it makes it on a, on a church context um, that narcissists can hide very easily in a church because narcissists, I believe, do not hide to be completely unseen. They hide so that the real version of them is unseen. And they, they, if they can hide in a church, they only have to really be that narcissist view, uh, that, that perfect view, that ideal view, several hours a week. And then it's very dangerous when you have a pastor or a youth pastor or a ministry leader or a deacon who has uh, narcissistic tendencies because it's going to be, mean a, a manipulation, an abuse of power, a victim mentality, and we'll cover all these things again tonight. 
Uh, so the origin, of course, is from a, a, the Greek mythological character named Narcissus who was walking by a reflecting pond and saw his reflection and fell in love with himself. And, uh, and he stayed there and he died there. And when he died there, a flower named uh, the Narcissus grew up in its place. Is this the Narcissus right here? So I didn't realize this. This is a Narcissus. So two weeks ago, I was preaching about this and telling you the, the story, the legend of Narcissus, and all the while, I had a Narcissus right behind me. Um, so I thought that was pretty, pretty funny. Um, so the definition of narcissism uh, is uh, complex, but it's a self-centered personality style. This quality in extreme contributes to a psychiatric condition marked by grandiosity, excessive need for attention and admiration, and an inability to empathize. I know I'm hurrying. Uh, these were all in your notes from, from last time. So we, that helped us arrive at, uh, it's sometimes good not just to define something, but to describe something. So here are some traits of a narcissist. The first one uh, was dishonest about themselves and about others. And along with this, I've added some phrases on the screen, and here they are, uh, something like, well, I would never do that, or my child would never do that. And so you can kind of hear uh, what would typically be a, a narcissistic way to approach a problem, but they're dishonest. We must function in the world of truth. We need people in our lives to speak the truth to us. If you are lucky enough to have someone in your life who is gonna speak the truth to you, embrace it. Be humble enough to respond correctly to it. Uh, don't dismiss it. Uh, don't uh, uh, choose to have, to believe in a deceitful view of of yourself, that's called an emotional immaturity. Dishonesty about ourselves is what a second grader does or what a junior high girl does. I know they call them middle schoolers now, but I call them junior hires. Um, they, they have an inflated view of themselves. They don't, they, they, don't, they don't think anything about them is bad. Everything's perfect. Uh, but di dishonesty about ourselves will always lead to superficial relationships. If I can't be honest with my wife, Karen, if she can't be herself with me, and I'm not gonna do it again, but you know, Adam and Eve were naked in front of each other and they still loved each other. And they said, this is me, yeah, this is me, and I love you, and I accept that. And they were naked and unashamed. And they're, 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 that's the way, that's married. Love is not blind. Love chooses to love the object in spite of all the flaws. And there's honesty that's involved in that and raw truth, and we ought to embrace that. So I need people, you need people to be real with you and raw with you and tell you things you don't want to hear. You need to learn how to respond right to those things. Um, disinterested, uh, trait number two, disinterested in making personal changes. And they would say something like this, I don't need personal growth. Remember, uh, they're high on arrogance, right? They score real high on arrogance and arrogant people are not usually believing there's anything about them that needs to change. Uh, this is why it's especially dangerous in a Christian setting, especially dangerous, dangerous if there's a pastor, a preacher, a leader, ministry leader, who doesn't think he or she ever needs to change. Uh, we never want to project that about ourselves. Uh, like it or not, someone's looking at you as a role model. Your kids are looking at you as an example. And if they've never heard mom and dad apologize, never heard mom and dad say, yeah, I goofed, I messed up, I screwed up, I shouldn't have done that, I made a mistake, never heard you apologize or make something right, then they're learning from you. They spend a lot of time with you. Uh, and so uh, we, we covered this one. I think we probably got to trait number three, and these first three are very similar, but we'll spend a little more time developing this last one here, number three. They're dismissive when the need for change is suggested. And I said, these, these are very closely connected and I think we started to end, I, I really felt like something really good connected with all of you last, uh, last time we did this, and that is kind of a, a role play I did. I forget who it was with. He was sitting right over here, but I uh, pretended like I was confronting him with something and uh, assumed that he turned around and said, you don't know what I'm going through. You just don't know what God is doing in my life. And this, this idea, it's, it's, it's a race to see who can make the most spiritual sounding statement when being confronted. Because as long as I can elevate myself above you and I can say, I, I can kind of dismiss the fact, dismiss that I need any change because you'll never understand what I'm going through. You never go through this, uh, you'll never understand. And God's really, I'm just so broken. And God's really working on me. And then that, that sounds real spiritual but really nothing transacted there, nothing changed. Nothing really was affected by that conversation. And that's kind of what we'll dig deeper in 
um, right now. And I, I don't know about you. I think I know about you. I know about me. I do have a hard time admitting when I'm wrong. I don't like to be wrong. You ever heard someone say, here's my opinion and I think it's right? You don't have to say that last part because you think all your opinions are right, all right? Um, so this uh, could stem as well from legalism in the Christian community. Maybe a lot of times we see narcissism ingrained. It's a, it is a behaviorally learned trait in many ways in their Parents are very legalistic and very showy and very, it's all about looking one way in front of a certain crowd, another way with another crowd, that's okay. If that will breed narcissists, you will raise your kids to be narcissists um, uh, by, with inflated egos and false ideas about their, themselves and uh, faking humility and things like that. Well, it's a good time for us to insert, and really this is new, uh, good time to insert what is called the DARVO technique. So you need to know what this is about. Anybody here ever heard of the DARVO technique? Okay, a couple of you have, good. This, is, this, this was new to me as I just did some research, but I'll go through it all on the screen and we'll explain it. So there's those five words for you to write down. It's a DARVO uh, uh, kind of response that you're going to encounter from uh, narcissists. So uh, psychologists have compiled some, some common de defense mechanisms into an acronym I guess it's an acronym, not an acrostic, it's an acronym. And um, so when you have to accuse someone or of something or you have to confront someone with something, uh, what you're gonna get from a narcissist is a DARVO response. It goes down the list. Deny, attack, reverse victim offender. So here's what that means. First, this person is going to deny the accusation is true. Just outright dismiss it, deny it. They're going to do something to distract you from what you have had the courage to confront them about. It's not easy. To, it takes great courage uh, to confront somebody. And so they're going to try to twist that away, deny that, and then they, after deny, then they reverse. They, they, then they attack you for maybe another problem. And then after you blow up and respond inappropriately, then they say, see, you're more angry than I am. And they'll reverse the victim offender role on you. And, and when I was explaining this to Karen, um, she started to deny and attack and no, <laughs> she didn't. Um, when I told this to Karen, she, she said what I've been thinking, like, well, we all tend to do this and uh, welcome to marriage, right? Welcome to, this is what, what most marriage arguments are like, no, no, I don't do that. Let me tell you, well, you're way worse than this. So um, you would say something to someone like, hey, you didn't empty the dishwasher last Monday and you said you would. Oh, what? You don't, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I had to do last Monday. Besides, you never take the trash out when it's your turn. And remember three years ago when, and you're like, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, it was your turn, it was the kid's turn. You, you, all of a sudden, you're, you're flustered because they've attacked you, and now all of a sudden, well, who called this meeting? I called this meeting. I wanted to talk to you about something. And they have flip-flopped that thing on you, and boy, I've discovered that narcissists are usually really good communicators. They are convincing. They are manipulative. Uh, and so you need to be aware, if you just think about this a little bit and be a little more keenly aware, even of yourself and of your, these kind of interactions, I think that you'll, you'll, you'll see that someone has probably used this against you to make you the victim, themselves the victim, and you the offender I'd say this is a sign of a really evil person. This is a really evil person that does this. If you encounter a Darvo, a couple of things you can do. Number one is you can just um, run. <laughs> you can just get away and you can say, time out, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk with you about this right now. Or you can just really keep the central thing, the main thing. You just keep, no, you know, it's really not about what I did three years ago. Can we, we can talk about that another time, but, um, it's really about how you said you would empty the dishwasher on Monday, but you didn't. And just keep staying there. Just keep driving that, that home and stay on the issue. The devil would love to get us to fight about things we're not even fighting about. So just keep the issue there. Um, 
So uh, this brings us, helps us realize, church, that a simple test of narcissism is how people respond when you bring a concern to them about them. How do you respond when people bring a concern to you about you? Hey, I've noticed the path that you're on, the choices you're making, something with your kids. Do you darvo them? See, here's what wise people do. Here's what godly people do. They listen. They make space for this. They hold their thoughts. They function with humility. They weigh the validity of the information. Kind of separate yourself from this third grade response of, yeah, but you don't come to church all the time. And you're kind of, you, you separate yourself from this reverse attack and try not to do that. That's what wise people do. You listen to the concern that's being brought up. You attune yourself. You empathize with what they're saying. And you take ownership and see if there's any truth. And you maybe say, thank you so much. I'm going to think about this. Pray about it. And you go talk to a pastor or someone you trust and say, you know, do I do this? Because so-and-so just, and they'll say, <laughs> yes, you do. And then, you, then uh, in, you know, multiple counselors, there's good safety there. So you start to think about it. Guess what? You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We all know that. The Bible says we're all sinners. So it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, you need to be aware of, of Darvo. Here's really this, this idea of being a victim. Can I just, I really want you to hear this. Um, be aware of people who rewrite history to always make themselves the victim. There's times when I have met people, talked people, and spending extended time with people, and it's like, they are the unluckiest person in the world because every job, every marriage, every church, every relationship, they've just been mistreated, abused, and victimized. Do you know anybody like that? It's not true. It's not true. It, there is some truth to it, but a lot of it is just lies. It's their choice to perceive things that way. A lot of us here could tell stories about ways we've been mistreated. But we don't, because the Lord's helped us with that. And we find no value in bringing it up constantly. Uh, so be aware of people like this who most of it is exaggerated. And they will win you. They'll, they'll try to win your heart. They'll win their, your loyalty. They'll, you'll give them your compassion. And they've got you. They'll lasso you in, and now... Uh, you're, part of, you're, you're part of their flying monkey band. And as soon as you expose them for who they are, they will go and they'll run away from that relationship and they will go to the next flying monkey and they will get all them flapped up about how you were mistreating them and they're a victim because of you. And around and around it goes where it stops, nobody knows. So Darvo is the main thing, the victimhood. Um, uh, just really be attuned to someone who's like, who's always talking bad about the past. I don't need that in my life. God is good. We've all had hurts. Uh, we've had misunderstandings, accusations. So many people wrestle with this. And here's where we come to Philippians 2, just to, to touch on this again. I, I don't believe that a victim mentality and the mind of Christ can exist at the same time. There's no way. I don't mean to casually talk about the cross, but do you know a more innocent victim than Jesus Christ? That he chose that, willingly took that. And of course, he was the God man. He was victorious over that. And you with God and Jesus Christ in your life, we can be victorious as well. But a victim mentality and the mind of Christ cannot exist at the same time and a believer, and I've seen it in ministry. I've seen people adopt this whole persona as pastors and as assistant pastors and as ministry leaders, and you just, just be aware of it. Please be aware of it. All right, another thing they're gonna do. Now, question or trait number four is, is disruptive when interpersonal problems arise. Anger issues, we're talking about anger issues, all right? So what angers a narcissist the most 
is anything that upsets their carefully curated self-image, their carefully curated image that they think everyone thinks about, if that is disrupted, if that is exposed, uh, they're going to blow up. Have you ever come across anyone who responds with disproportionate anger as well? Like, that wasn't even that big of a deal, dude. And you're demanding my firstborn son? I mean, relax. People fly off the handle, and the anger does not fit the crime. And boy, you really touched on a button there, or we've, we've experienced this. I'm, I'm sure you have. They shouldn't be as angry as they are about that little thing. So research in 1972 We've always known some people are more prone to anger than others, but research in 1972 labeled this narcissistic rage, which causes people to fly into a rage with what might seem like the slightest provocation or no obvious provocation at all. Um, we'll get into a guy in the scriptures, uh, possibly tonight, but certainly in next week, uh, who I think is, and I, I read a great book on him, uh, it's Haman. Um, so don't write in the blank, the last blank is Haman. Don't write it in yet, just save it for later. Um, Haman, whom at a very little, little thing, because Mordecai did not bow to him, wanted to exterminate the entire Jewish race. Yeah, that might be an overreaction. You might have an inflated ego, Haman, if you think that is a solution, that the only solution that will satisfy your problem. So, anger, other words here, aggression, passive aggression. Um, when they experience a setback or disappointment, or what, whatever shatters his or her illusions of grandiosity, entitlement, superiority, or whatever triggers an inadequacy, shame, or vulnerability. Um, some people try to be tall by cutting off the heads of others. And don't be that person. Keep in mind, though, that not all angry outbursts are, is narcissistic rage. Sometimes we just are full of the flesh. Sometimes we just burst and uh, we blow up. And other people seethe and they simmer and they're resentful. There's so many different kinds of anger and there is a man here in the audience has written a book on it so I'm not going to talk too much more about it in front of him. <laughs> um, trait number five, disgusted by your needs. They are disgusted by your needs. It's all about their needs. Stop making things about you. Stop making this about you. This is about me. Oh, this is, uh, this is the manipulation. We haven't really, we, we have yet still to really touch, and we told the joke about gaslighting, but you might not know what gaslighting is. Um, but they're going to manipulate you. Um, pastor friend of mine named Ryan Thompson in uh, Newport Beach, California said this, in a toxic environment, every person is a pawn who exists to accomplish my purposes. In a healthy environment, every person is a unique piece of the puzzle that all works together beautifully to accomplish God's plan. See, a narcissist, to a narcissist, everything's about them. Again, just think about your, your, your typical day, your typical approach to your week, how, how you run your house as a man, how you function as a woman, as a spouse, as a wife, a mom in your house. Is everything about you, your comfort? Men, we drive home from work and we have, in our minds, if, if I don't get home and the kids aren't well-mannered and the house isn't clean and dinner's not ready and my wife's not in a good mood and... Then, then it's gonna, and we walk in, and none of those things are in place, and we, we, uh, we're disgusted that our needs aren't being met. What about the needs? What, what about, look, not every man to his own thing, but every man also on the things of others? What about driving home and saying, you know, I'm sure my wife's had a long day. I'm sure the kids have, I probably don't enjoy school. I never enjoyed school. I'm sure the kids probably hated school today. They're probably in a bad mood. And, and maybe I need to walk in with joy and with encouragement. I'm going to walk in, and maybe I'll stop and buy, buy something for the family. Maybe we can go out and get ice cream tonight. And what, how can I minister? And then you'll be a lot happier that way. You'll be a lot happier when you, when you seek to approach life from that way. 
So I think about this in the context of parenting uh, and the, the selfish kids I'm raising. How many of you have selfish kids? Good. The Browns do, Jason does, okay, good. Anybody else over here on this side have, you know what, I've found my kids are selfish because they are being raised by professional selfish people. I'm a professional, and I'm a good teacher, and they have imitated me very, very well. Um, it, it, I'm 40, am I 45? I'm 45. I can't be a selfish kid anymore. I got a selfish kid, <laughs> right? I can't be selfish anymore. So um, a while ago, in a kind of a silly way, I jotted down you might want to borrow some of these. My three most important parenting priorities for my children. This is not in the notes, but this is, this is good. Um, number one, I want to raise my kids to not be the type of kid that gets hit by 15 balls in dodgeball and swears he didn't get hit. Well, 19 other kids insist that they hit him He's like, no, no, it didn't hit me. It didn't hit me. No, it didn't hit me. And he just, he stays in the game. He got, he got creamed. I don't want to raise a kid like that. Do you? Do you know the type? Do you know the type of kid I'm talking about? Yeah, I don't want to raise a kid like that. So that's kind of funny. But number two, we talk about this a lot as a pastor's family, um, just as Christians. I'm not raising my kids to go through life like a victim. I'm not going to do it. Or, or, or thinking, this is common in narcissism, thinking that everyone else's agenda out there is evil and sinister, but my motives are always pure. You're wrong about that. <laughs> it's very easy to, to, to become a cynic in this world, to become very judgmental of people, while elevating your said, well, I would never do that. Number three, teach them to have compassion and put others first. I do want to finish these traits. There's two left tonight. If you have any questions or comments, we'll take them at the end and we'll see if we can figure anything out. Trait number six, dissatisfaction with their association with you. They're going to get tired of you eventually and move on to someone else. You're dead to me. You're dead to me. You walk by some people sometimes and it's like, I must be invisible because they don't even have the character to say hi or to smile. We're, we're going to have disagreements with people. You can't just cancel people. This is part of that cancel culture, really, um, and more of that later, but... Um, a, a narcissist or a group of narcissists, I've had this happen to me, will take people who used to be your friends and turn them against you. Once they, once they have your trust, they'll say things like, Henry, you really should know something about Christina. <laughs> Can I tell you something about Christina? Yeah. And now what, what am I, if I'm really good at this, then all of a sudden Henry's like, wow, this person is letting me in a little secret about, I'm going to stay away from Christina, and now I'm getting his trust. I want him to look to me as a leader, as an authority. Or sometimes people in churches say, say things like, you know, you don't even know what's going on in that church. You don't even know what's going on in that church. What, we don't, we use single-ply toilet paper? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's for the budget, all right? They have no, nothing that they're actually, no factual information. They were hurt. They were offended. There's something that they probably should just make that break and leave the church, and we wish they would because we need unity. Protect the unity. When you join a church, by the way, you are signing on. We just talked about this at our membership class Saturday. We tell everyone this, joining the church. Hey, you are, you are to work to protect the unity of the church. You, you are to protect the unity of the body. You have a disagreement. Uh, you don't come to me. You go to that person first. You come to me first, I'll say, hey, do you go on to that person? And I won't get involved until you go to that person. But if you can't maintain unity, you need to go somewhere else because there is some kind of free-for-all Baptist church or disunity Baptist church you can go to. 
You should know what's happening at your church. You should know what happened in the past. And they'll just drop little hints like that, and they'll try to get people to be disassociated with one thing or another, and then they'll move on, and get this, hear me now, they'll move on to the next person who is just gonna be a pawn in a chess game to them. Relationships are not genuine to a narcissist. They are more like a chess game where everything is analyzed. Hey, lean in real fast, listen. Set yourself free from that kind of thinking. Please, set yourself free. Oh, I know why that person did that. I know why that pastor said that. I know why they chose that carpeting. Tell me. You seem to have all the answers. <laughs> set yourself free from thinking the worst about people. I know we're kind of framing this in, you know, stay away from narcissists, so it's kind of ironic to say. But you have to, you know, by, by fruits and by behaviors, you can observe certain things and make judgment calls and give, ask the Lord to give you wisdom. But by and large, I found that people are, are mostly, they have good motives. And people are just sinners, and people make mistakes, and there's misunderstandings, and some people actually walk by you because they had a lot on their mind, and they didn't think to say hi to you. They're, it's not, they're, they're not mad at you. So don't invent scenarios. We do this. Don't, do you ever do this? You invent scenarios, and if you ever wonder, just go up to a person and say, hey, is there, is there something going on? And if someone ever says that to you, don't make it worse. Why did you think something was going on? I don't think so. Okay, I love you, love you too. Here's a donut, bye. That's all you have to do. Oh, just set yourself free from everything being analyzed with all the people in your life. So it's, it's a tendency of a narcissist. Be secure in who you are in Christ. Be humble enough to take secondary roles, to take not the limelight position. The devil really is gonna mess with us in this, especially in, in a church like ours, a church our size with different ministries and relationships. There's gonna be misunderstandings. Trait number seven, disturbed when you fail to agree wholeheartedly with their feelings or decisions. And here's where, again, the cancel culture that we see everywhere today comes into play. I once worked for a pastor who, and I have in my notes here, a one and done mentality. Like, as soon as someone fails you one time, it's like you write them off. Like, I don't need that person. And um, this pastor I, I, I served and benefited greatly from, but at times he had a one and done approach to staff. Like if you came late to a meeting for the rest of your life, <laughs> you were tardy. <laughs> oh yeah, they're always late. Always meaning that one time they were late. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a tendency of human nature is to, is to kind of carve people into a certain niche and say, well, that, well he's, a goop, he's a goober. She's a nerd. Um, she's annoying. He talks too much. And we kind of we put people in different drawers and categories. And I'm not saying we, we won't do that. And we'll kind of have our jokes about people. And I'm sure you have your jokes about people, including me. Which is fine. I can handle it. But, but for, uh, taking it a step further and kind of writing them off and thinking sinfully about them, that's something else. So this one and done mentality, like if, you, if you fail me, um, or if you don't agree with me, then we're done. They'll cut you off. They'll cut you off completely. And narcissists also tend to travel in packs. They travel like wolves. So they instinctively draw people to them who will magnify their feelings. Now, in a sense, we all hang out with people we have things in common with, right? Right? All the Alabama fans in this church, two of us. There's things that draw us together, and hey, similar shows, similar interests, similar sports, uh, similar senses of humor, similar love of hobbies or whatever it might be. We have certain things that draw us and kind of help us link arms with people in a stronger way than others. But uh, when sin is the commonality, when narcissism is the commonality, that is unhealthy, that is dangerous. 
when that commonality is a dangerous personality trait. Um, and let me give you the blank so we can, uh, you can file this one away. So um, next question, getting us into next category, is what can we observe about narcissism from Haman in the Old Testament book of Esther? I came across a great resource that really helps kind of analyze and, and kind of uh, look at deeply the story of uh, Haman's role in that story. Now, we, we preached on Esther not that long ago, so you, though Haman should be somewhat familiar in our minds, but the first thing we see, and we'll leave on this tonight, narcissists are petty. They're petty. I already mentioned this, but he was upset that Mordecai did not bow to him, so we'll start back here next time, next Wednesday, Lord willing. But um, petty. Narcissists are going to be upset about very, very petty things. Um, and so we'll, we'll come back and, and look at a few verses on forgiveness. Um, so tonight, don't drop people. Don't use people. Don't manipulate people. Don't think evil of people. This all comes by seeking to have the mind and the motives of Christ, we find in Philippians chapter number two. That's a tall order. That's a tall order to, to mimic that. Any questions, comments, observations, any blanks that you need filled in tonight at all? Yeah, Colin. Colin. Yeah, I do. I think they're on the right track there with that, with loyalty. Yeah, they need that loyalty. Mm -hmm. And again, we're. I mean, we all need loyalty, right? We it's not so certain things. We're at a certain point, the extremity of this, the grandiosity, grandiosity of it, from the definition, this in the extreme gets inappropriate. You know. Um, good question. Yeah, the loyalty. Okay, we learning? We okay? Okay, the more important thing is not the narcissist in my life. It's the narcissist, you know, in us. We want to be aware of that. We all have a little bit, okay? All right, let's pray, and we'll let you go get your kids or go home. Please be careful uh, in your boat on the way home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the service tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our church this week. We pray it would continue, Lord, as we examine this trait, as you have uh, spoken to us, and Lord, um, help us to apply the mind of Christ, the passage about your humility and the things that you took upon yourself for us and that we might uh, display that to, to this world. Help us to be others-minded and, uh, Lord, very humble in our relationships, very gracious in the way we speak, um, and, Lord, be an encouragement to others, not an annoyance not manipulate people, uh, Lord, but um, work together with people for the gospel and for reaching this world. We ask, Lord, for uh, safety as we go home and, and Lord, uh, of course, uh, blessing on Sunday uh, as uh, we look in uh, the book of Acts as well as Vision Night and our business meeting. We pray that it'll go off very well and that you'll help us to have good attendance that night. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.